Uh, I've seen tonight's guest in person was back in 1995 when him and I were fellow writers for a local newspaper called the Park Slope Journal. Uh, fast forward nine years later and this prolific Park Slope author has made a name for himself in the literary world and among the community of fame authors from Park Slope. Since the age of 15, he's been writing for the New York Press, doing everything from movie and music reviews to New York City neighborhood vignettes. His keen and hilarious observations and tales on city culture can be found in the hundreds of essays he's written, everything from the unsavory Coney Island junkyard dealers, junkies, and urban legends to going to the gym and buying oversized condoms, for example. He's also written articles and essays for the New York Times Magazine and Newsday. His passion for writing has helped him produce two book efforts in his latest fiction novel offering, Be More Chill. That has been published internationally to many rave newspaper reviews which span longer than the Great Wall of China. Just look at his site. He's also got a movie deal option with the Weiss brothers. Those are the uh, brothers who brought you American Pie 1 and 2. So that's exciting news for the book story, Be More Chill. Currently, he hosts a bi-weekly reading series at Barbess here in the Slope on Thursdays, featuring a lineup of local authors uh, and writers. And he's also been leading a competition in the New York City Public Schools in which students can get to have their chance to have their uh, short fiction stories published. And, you know, in, in the library even. It's very encouraging. It's uh, a way to get people to read more and participate because there are a lot of brilliant minds out there. When, when does this man sleep? Like, uh, it's not, he's doing so much. He doesn't. He he's just amazing. writes. He just writes he's and amazing. writes and writes. It's a compulsion, you know. He's also hosting a showcase at PS122 entitled Feed the Young Writers 2004 on Tuesday night, September 28th. Finally, nice to see him back in 2004 and not in the embarrassing childhood days of Woodward Park summer camp. Please welcome to the show, Ned Vizzini. Yeah, thanks. Thanks pleasure, a lot. Pleasure to have you on. Thanks for having me. Man, it's been a long while since you and I went to summer camp back in the day, <laughs> Woodward Park. I wonder, I don't know if you remember. And then back we were, you know, writing for that ragtag newspaper, the humanist paper, the Park Slope Journal, which was uh, a lot of That's fun. That's right, that was my first foray into writing something somewhere where it would get printed and seen by other people. But yeah, let's um, talk about how you started your relationship with the New York Press. This is something sure. I've always wanted to know. I wonder how one gets in, in on working for a uh, independent, uh, progressive-minded paper. Right, well, it's, it's not as hard as you might think, but a lot of young people today ask me about how they can break into the world of writing, and frankly, you know, it's a little bit harder than it used to be. Um, when I got started, I simply was picking up New York Press in high school and reading these essays by... Jonathan Ames and Amy Sohn, a lot of writers who are writing sort of confessional pieces that I really loved, and I th thought maybe I could write something like that. They were all writing about sex and drugs. I didn't really have any sex or drugs in my life at that time, but I thought maybe if I wrote about snot and vomit, you know, the press might be interested. So I went and wrote an essay about my high school, and I just looked in the front of the paper underneath the masthead where it listed all the writers. There was a tiny address that said, send unsolicited submissions to and I said all right great and I put my little envelope together and sent it in and I got all excited and then two weeks later it came back in the mail not enough postage oh man so I uh, I put more stamps on I sent it back and um, after a little while the editor called me up and he actually I'd totally forgotten about it at this point but he said he liked what I wrote and I should try writing things a little bit shorter. Mm -hmm. And that's how I sort of started my freelance career there. So don't be deterred by problems with the mail. That's really the lesson. You did end up going to Stuyvesant, which right. is not really the writer's school, but, you know, I mean... It, oh, there were a lot of people. And people in Stu Stuyvesant is sort of the school where you, you know, you go if you're smart and you can get in, and then but your parents don't want to pay for the tremendous amounts of money that it costs to send your kids to private school in New York, which is prohibitive for most people, and I was pretty lucky to get in. It was full of kids. I mean, there were some kids who were like, you know, freshmen taking multivariate calculus, uh, and it has that reputation as a math and science school. But it was full of people who were big into writing, too, and it had a lot of little literary journals that generally didn't like my stuff, so I just kind of leapfrogged them and wrote for newspapers. I've always, always, always had the ability to meet up 
with nuts. Nutty people have always been a big part of my life and have always been attracted to me psychically. You're and, New York. Right. No, but it's really, it's more than the average New Yorker. I mean, today this guy who was hacking through my bike chain because my bike accidentally got locked up in East Village and I couldn't get through it. His name was Dimitri and he started telling me how his brother was a cop and then some woman came by and was asking him, hey, is that your bike, you know, that you're hacking up? And he started telling her, why don't you take your kid around the block? My mother, my brother's a cop and he works at this, you know, Dimitri was a real character. And like these people just come to me. And one thing I learned at Stuyvesant was I sort of learned how to fall in with different groups of people. You know, I didn't have, I wasn't really with the preppy kids. I wasn't really with the with the pothead kids or with the real party kids or with the jocks, but I was able to sort of intersperse myself into those groups from time to time to kind of see how they interacted. And I didn't really, with each other and with the other groups, and I didn't really realize it at the time, but I was sort of developing that writer's skill of being able to just make yourself kind of invisible and go into a group and see, go, see how people really are, you know, and note it and remember it for yourself. And Stuyvesant had this incredibly different um, groups of people, and I think I learned a lot from seeing seeing how they all worked, how they thought, and being in an environment with them. But you always, um, you know, meeting interesting people, urban legends, freaks of nature, and otherwise, any other label we want to give them, you always have a knack to just write and write and write. What sort of fuels that uh, passion? Well, I, I mean, I think that when it comes to writing, it's something that I write when I feel guilty for not writing. It's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I sort of always feel like no matter what else is going on in my life that I should be just documenting things and moving forward because it's something that I love to do, it's something I've always loved to do, it's something I'm lucky enough to you know have gotten paid for and a lot of people don't ever get paid for what they love to do and so I don't want to lose it you know so really just a drive to keep going and keep developing and getting better that's what makes me do it all the time. George Orwell said there were four reasons that a person be right. And I really love these reasons. So there's one, the first reason was sheer egoism, desire to be known and to show up your classmates. And I'm definitely guilty of that one. Uh, number two was um, the uh, desire, just the beauty of it, the beauty of the language, and like the beauty of putting a nice sentence together and how that makes you feel. And I definitely know what he's talking about there too. And then uh, number three and four, I kind of forget, but the first two, those are, um, those are good reasons. You write because you're egotistical and you write because it's beautiful. And then I also write because I want to show a lot of young people out there that they can do it, you know, and that's important to me to mm -hmm. make it clear that they can pursue what they like to do in writing or art or whatever they love to do. That is true. And of course, uh, this would be a good time to mention the project that you're involved in. Right, this is something that just starting up, you can tell whenever I'm just starting a project because I don't have graphics for it yet. <laughs> when we, wait a minute, I actually, I sort of do have a graphic for this, uh, a logo that, that has been designed, but we're doing the New York City Student Writing Showcase this year. Um, it's something that I'm coordinating in conjunction with the Office of School Library Services with the Department of Ed. So what we're doing is we're taking the best 50 submissions from student writers in the New York City high school, public high school system, and collecting them and putting them in an anthology. The New York City Student Writing Showcase Anthology 2004 slash five, and we're gonna publish it in spring and give a copy to each student who contributes to just sort of guide them through the process of writing and get it, handing their work in, and they'll get one round of edits with their English teachers, and putting it back and then seeing it in print because a lot of these people have tremendous writing talents but don't ever get a taste of success that would make them continue to try and write. So the New York City Student Writing Showcase, um, we're, we're getting the website up, we're going out there and raising money. It's going to be something that you should just Google whenever you uh, hear about it or see this and you'll find it uh, burbling along. This is its inaugural year and I'm putting a lot of time and effort into it reading in America is in big trouble, you know, and the, 